and original. From Story Studio Network. I want you to think about this. Canadian forestry has a role to play in saving the planet. Absolutely. The answer is yes. Welcome to this Story Studio Network podcast series. I'm Dave Trafford. In this series, Aaron Trafford and I will explore a number of ideas that hinge on the notion of Canadian forestry helping to save the world. There's no path to a net zero carbon economy without the forest sector and forest products, full stop. We'll talk about how and why Canadian forests have the ability to shift the climate crisis and the economy to build a better future. There is no machine and no process known to man better than a tree that's sequestering carbon. We'll explore innovations in forest management that drive a green economy and directly address the climate issue. We have a significant amount of the world's forest land. With that privilege comes the responsibility of taking care of it. So welcome in to this special series produced for Forestry for the Future. Can I just uh, voice a complaint before we sort of dive into this episode? I mean, can I really stop you at this point? Okay, I'll take that as a go ahead. I'd love to hear what you have to say (laughs) as usual. Very generous of you. Okay, okay, fine. I'll indulge one complaint. You know what? We've got way too much great material for this episode. Shouldn't that be a nice problem to have? Well, it's a problem because we've got two really brilliant voices on this show. Besides ours. Yeah. Right? Yes. Two brilliant guests. (laughs) They both bring an international perspective to the subject we've been talking about in the last episode. That's the bioeconomy. We've got some pretty fulsome perspective of the Canadian bioeconomy from Monique Frizon at Natural Resources Canada. Mahima Sharma from the Forest Product Association of Canada was also involved in that conversation. Don't forget Nick Milestone. Nick, remember, was the one who really helped us talk about the Canadian bioeconomy in terms of the ROI for investors and developers, builders, governments, consumers, and the climate. And we've learned that the Canadian bioeconomy has a lot of headroom for growth. And much of that growth potential is beyond our borders. So in this episode, what we're going to do is zoom out and take a look at that larger market from an international perspective. What are other forestry leading countries like Sweden, for example, doing to boost its bioeconomy and What can Canada bring to the bioeconomy that gives us a foothold in the global market? So this episode is going to be a bit of a departure from the others in the series. We're going to feature a couple of sit-down interviews I did with Virginie Chambos. I'm Virginie Chambos. I'm the principal consultant and president of Envertis Consulting based out in Montreal. Now, Virginie joined us from halfway around the world where she's doing work with the forestry sector in New Zealand. And she does have a very French, dare I say, exotic accent. Uh, we're also in this episode going to hear from Peter Holmgren. Internationally, I've been working with the UN and I've been heading up the Centre for International Forestry Research. And over the past five years, I've been working mainly with the Swedish forest industry to develop their sustainability platforms and, and particularly related to climate. And we want to start with Peter. As you heard in his introduction, much of his work is focused on the sustainability of the Swedish forest sector, particularly as it relates to climate. Peter Holmgren will tell you there are three parts to the bioeconomy. The first is the industry related to simply harvesting the timber, but we can't understate that. The second is related to the wood products that come from the timber. The third would be the climate benefits that come from the first two. And there's value in the harvesting, there's value in the manufactured wood product, but there's also value in the climate benefits such as carbon storage. But for whatever reason, we're not really very good at seeing the economic connection between these three parts. We look at the forests on one side, and then we look at all the other economic sector separately. And this means that there is a lot of focus on the forest as such. But that focus is 
often disconnected from all the good things that wood-based products can do in the other economic sectors. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong in the way we report this. It's just that the benefits of the wood-based products are not connected to the benefits of the forest as such. And therefore, we, 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 end up, we tend to end up with policies that try to preserve the forest because that's supposedly good for the climate. And we forget that the harvested wood will do a lot more for the climate as well. How do we bridge that gap in, 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 with some urgency? Because this is, this is upon us now. It's mm. not a matter of, you know, when. It's, it is happening. Mm. Um, and then just the degree to which we are more active uh, and proactive mm. will be the degree to which we can mitigate the climate change crisis. So yeah. how do yeah. we, with some urgency, bridge that communication gap? I think that we quickly need to to establish in politics that that there are at least two different ways of dealing with forests. One is, yes, we need to preserve, we need to conserve uh, large areas of forest so that they are not converted to something else, rainforests, for example. We don't want them deforested. But then on the other hand, we have lots of forests that are managed, and they are managed particularly to supply wood to society. And those forests are not well taken care of in climate policy. That there's some urgency in realizing that. And when we realize that, we, we should fig- take the next step and, and realize that what is it that makes us manage the forest so that it is stable, it continues to grow, will grow even better, and it stores more and more carbon? Well, it is because we manage them for the value of timber. So it is actually the harvesting that brings the climate benefit in the forest. And it is also the harvesting that brings the benefits of wood-based products to society. So we should we should be much more um, open-minded about harvesting as the driving factor. It puts value into the forest and it puts value into society. Is that a, a cultural sort of obstacle? Is it strictly a political blinders? What what do you think is the the, the obstacle or the, the 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 issue that we have to overcome here? I think in part we, we're just stuck with some structures that were developed early on in the climate process. Um, the the enhancement and, and of sinks in, on one hand and the reduction of emissions on another. And then we've had separate tracks developing policies along these lines. And of course, if you have a separate policy that deals with sinks, you will get you will be more blind to the to the reducing emission side and vice versa. So we're living with these structures, and sometimes I liken it with the with the realization that we have gender issues in society. It's because we have structures that you need to realize that that they are there and they are they are uh, hindering our progress until we're aware of them and can can deal with them. So, as well intended as they may have been, they become get in their own way. Yes, one example of this is the European policy on. It's called LULUCF, land use, land use change, and, and forests. Um, and and uh, essentially, that is about how much more carbon can we store in the forests to compensate for, for emissions elsewhere. And that's a typical policy that only looks at the storage of carbon in the forest and, and doesn't really take into account that actually if we harvest the forest, we might reduce more of those emissions uh, in other sectors. So it, it's about this this bridging. This is really... A key, a key factor for for moving forward. Who has to be the voice that pulls that thread through, so we don't necessarily have these siloed, well-intended structures, as you put it, um, that get in their own way. Uh, the, the solutions lie with the products. So I think it, it is on on the on the industry side that we that the 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 story and, and the, the arguments need to be developed and, and the connection to the forest need to be established that, you know, sustainably managed forests helps us to develop these products, which are good for the climate. So, so the industry certainly has a big role. On the political side, there are some, some good initiatives. I mean, we see many initiatives that is not, it's about uh, trying to put a, put a break on, on, on forestry. That's not good, but there are also some positive policy instruments. The European Union has something called the European Bauhaus Initiative, which is all about 
um, increasing the use of, of uh, wood for, for construction and buildings and, and, and so on. Um, very strong initiative, very, very positive goals. Unfortunately, it's not so well connected to the, to the forest policies that are developed by different departments. So th- that's a regulated or is that incentivizing the use of wooden construction? It's in, oh, I guess it's both, uh, but I think the regulation is more on a national, on the national level. Mm. Like uh, public buildings are supposed to be uh, to a certain uh, proportion made out of wood. Where's the departure point there when you say that, that this is a great idea in terms of building with wood, but that policy is kind of departs from our forest management view? Where, where's, where's the breakdown? Sometimes I express it in a way that unfortunately forests ended up in the environment corner when it comes to sustainable development. But sustainable development has other dimensions too. We can't only talk about the forest as, as an environment issue. I think that, that explains to some degree where the debate went wrong and, and where the, the questions asked about the forests were, were, are mostly focused on the forest environment, which is important, obviously. Uh, but we tend to, you know, downgrade the the productive uh, functions of the forest, the the the, the role of forests in in uh, rural economies, and, and uh, um, the role of forest products in in uh, supporting welfare and the the, the climate actions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you know, we're back to the structures that that we're we're ending up with forest being an environment issue, a little bit too much. The idea, though, that we do have these solutions and particularly you know the nordic countries are are viewed as certainly industry leading we here in canada like to think that we've got a, sort of a, a global leading forest management sector but to what degree does canada learn from the nordic countries in europe and vice versa no i think bo- both canada and, and the nordic countries and many uh, many other countries too have, have advanced forestry and they have advanced uh, forest industry set up so so and and they've emerged out of the conditions that are established locally i mean canada is a huge country with very long distances so you you will have more difficulties to use uh, side streams from the forest for for district heating for example because the forest is simply too far away and it doesn't be, it, it becomes uneconomic to, to transport the biomass. Um, whereas in, in Sweden, particularly, this has been a political movement over the past 30, 40 years to, to invest in, in uh, district heating in, in almost every city in, in the country. And the forests are all around. So, so you, you, you get some, some economy into this. And, and that's why these days, uh, 40% of the Swedish energy supply is, is bioenergy. Uh, very much to do with with this, and we've phased out oil for for heating almost completely. Um, so you know, it's not that the differences are there for a reason. I guess that's my point. Where I think things could improve possibly is is uh, higher degrees of integration at the at, on the industry side. Um, the solutions here are very much in the products. So if if there could be higher degrees of integration between sawmills and pulp mills, for example, in in, um, using the different fractions of of, of wood for the best purpose possible. Um, That's something that both Sweden and Finland have worked very hard on for for many years. Is there a conversation or I almost want to call call it a, a market where there is an opportunity to export solutions where perhaps, you know, we're not going to use the biomass in Canada as, as uh, well and efficiently for heating as you may in Sweden, but we can provide the product that helps you do, uh, you know, achieve that objective. I don't know. Is there a, is there a way to ex- export solutions, I guess? Yeah, I think that's what we see already. I mean, you're exporting a lot to the U S I think still might be less than in the past, but, um, and, and in, in the case of Sweden, we export 80% of our products. So, of course, one way to look at it is that all that building material that we're exporting to UK or, or, or Central Europe, um, it is also exporting climate solutions because they will reduce emissions in those countries. Similarly, 
um, there is a fair bit of, of electricity generated in, in the pulp mills these days. And that electricity on the margin gets exported too and, and reduces uh, coal-fired electricity in, in, in other places. Um, if we have new developments of liquid biofuel, obviously that will be easier to export as well. And then you have all the paper base, paper products that, that mainly are exported. So this is another part of this, um, um, you know, structural issue that um, we don't really get benefits from all those exported climate benefits. If I'm hearing Peter correctly, we need to view the value of harvesting almost on two different levels, right? The first is the harvest providing the raw material for manufacturing. But second, the harvest as part of this sophisticated forest management plan as a climate benefit because the harvested wood is storing the carbon and it provides the opportunity for then the forest to be renewed, which then means more carbon Yeah, yeah the harvest, in his view, is foundational to the bioeconomy. It's hard to sell or manufacture or sell biofuels, right, if you don't cut down a tree. So I thought it was interesting to hear him talk about these policy tracks that kind of crop up. There are well-intended efforts to take care of the environment, but in the end, they compete with each other. So, for example, as a policy in Sweden, it promotes forest preservation as a means of increasing carbon capture. On its own, not bad. But Peter says that idea is blind to the carbon capture benefits of harvesting the forest. I also thought it was interesting to hear him say the solutions to these policy log jams, pun intended, lie with the products that are being manufactured, the use of wood product in new and different ways. And... That's primarily what will be driven by innovation in the private sector. Yeah, and that brings us nicely to my conversation with Virginie. Innovation is all at once the backbone and the brain that's going to propel the new and emerging technologies of the 21st century bioeconomy. But that's going to take some muscle. Innovation is hard. Innovation is risky. Innovation takes time. Innovation would be the key for the future of the industry. But we are in a pretty conservative industry, very commodity-oriented industry. We push volume to the market. Now what we need is to push value to the market. And, you know, understanding what will be those market needs, it's hard. It's, it's not easy. And when you are running a meal, you focus on your operation on a daily basis. You don't have the leisure of just forecasting what would be the market in the next 10, 20 years from now. So there has been many things done, and I can see that here in Cyan, but we have many opportunities and many expertise that has been brought together in Canada, in Europe, South America. Things are emerging all over the place. But now there are many things that could be interesting and how to pick and choose and how to move to the next stage. This is where we are. It's, uh, it, it's hard. But you're right. To, to actually be innovative, you need to be prepared to fail. And oh, yeah. that's, there's the risk. That's the hard part. And so let me ask you then, is, is the forest industry sort of its, and I say this with all due respect, its own worst enemy because it's risk, too risk averse? It is risk averse, especially, and uh, let me point that I'm speaking with the Canadian perspective. Uh, going South America would be completely different in Europe as well. We have certain constraints and we have also the infrastructure that we have. And we still need to invest into this infrastructure to modernize it, to make sure that it's top of the game. So, yeah, I think we are risk adverse, but for good reasons. And I think that uh, we should not take anything for granted when you have billions of dollars to invest into a strategy. And it's not only investing in the technology, it's the impact of implementing it in retrofit to your meal, uh, the impact on the process, the impact on the quality of the product. And all of these things make it a risky approach, but there are some ways to de-risk that step by step. And we have amazing example in Canada of things happening. Is it happening too slowly? Potentially. Is it happening that, you know, we are not, um, we are not um, 
pushing it too much to the market. Yeah, I think we are not taking enough of a business approach. We are taking a lot of uh, technology push, technology innovation approach. So how can we do that? How can we build on our advantages? Because we do have competitive advantages in Canada. We have a workforce here. We have expertise. We are all the time speaking about, oh, we are lacking, you know, uh, expertise, you know, like we need to attract new brain to, to, to our industry. It's true. But we have already existing knowledge and know-how specific to that uh, that first piece of the value chain, which is wood harvesting and first wood processing and transformation. We need to build on that. We have access to the forest. We do that in a very sustainable manner. We have access to research centers. We have access to uh, tons of things that could help us to springboard to the next step. But... It's how we can we do that? How can we put all of those pieces of the puzzles together so that we are not reinventing the wheel, but we are just pushing the innovation, considering the context that we have and the competitive advantages we have that no other country around may have? How can we build on this? So it's, it's kind of, um, yes, it's a risk adverse industry, but it's not because it's a risk adverse that there are no solutions. And that we should not try to replicate whatever is done around. We should try to understand what we have as advantages beyond those. And then after I move to the next stage and identify how we can contribute to the greater mean of Canada with the beyond net zero target that we have 2050, but also on the international market. And this is also maybe one thing that, uh, that is part of the, of the discussion is that it's it's international value chains that we are talking about. It's not only, uh, you know, local and, and specific value chain. It's it's really, it, it has, we need to take an approach that is more global. And innovation is about that. Technology has no frontier. There is no borders on that. Expertise, there is no borders on expertise neither. So how can we team up? How can we move, you know, um, um, getting a specific response to what is our current context and economic issues that we have within the industry while building on our assets and move to the next stage. So there's three things now that you've added to my list I want to talk about. I want to get at the, <laughs> the I want to get at this this question of the advantages that we have. Um, the local nature of of the perspective that we have. But just before we get there, I want to go back to the the uh, the your, your point around um, not being like, you know, the Nordic countries or South America, et cetera, and where we need to be less risk averse. At, is the risk there not um, sort of built, baked into the regulation? And that is to say that some of the slowdown happens because most of our forestry and forest operations are done on crown land. It's publicly owned land as opposed to the United States and Brazil, et cetera. So they wouldn't have the same kind of structural guardrails in terms of guidelines and regulation around it. Um, that might be a hard sell for the Canadian public to say, we want to be more innovative if that means that we would deregulate or you know, soften some of that uh, uh, limitation around how we harvest, where we harvest. Excellent point. Uh, and it's a hot topic uh, within the industry, I think. Um, and perhaps instead of um, rather supporting or not your point, what I'm going to say is that even though we recognize this as being potentially a constraint, being positive and negative, but this is a constraint and there may be no way around that if we think like that. How can we still move forward? And I don't think, I really do not think that this is a major barrier to innovation or a major barrier to the bioeconomy. I do though think that in some contexts, and a recent work done by the CCFM uh, has demonstrated it that depending where we are within Canada, um, access to residues potentially, uh, it's uh, it's not economically viable. And then though those residues are there and that biomass is there and could be potentially a gold mine, you know, to move forward with something. So in specific jurisdiction, so not Canada-wide, but in specific jurisdiction, there may be a potential to support 
uh, or to minimize those barriers uh, by implementing specific regulation uh, to make it economically viable. And I think it's more about having access to this economically viable biomass, maybe less about the ownership, but maybe more about having regulation in place that will support where we are going. But though it's not all about the regulation. I do strongly believe that if there is a push from the market, if there is an opportunity that we identify of using those residues, of targeting specific end products or specific value chains, that at the end of the day, we will use that as being a tool to realize the business model, but not as being a driver to for innovation. And I think this is how I want to bring the discussion is that we certainly need governmental support, new regulation in place. We need to have um, potentially revised or updated way of how funding is supporting the industry, where the industry is now to move forward. Certainly, but these are tools in my perspective. The innovation should come from the market. The innovation should come from the industry and the vision should be set by the industry rather than waiting for the right regulation in place to then jump on the wagon. Okay, so talk to me then about Canada's place, Canada's role in the larger bioeconomy globally, specifically as it relates to these uniquely Canadian advantages that you've outlined. Well, we are sitting on the, again, the same word, the gold mine. <laughs> we have extremely well-defined uh, harvesting practices aligned with sustainable targets here in Canada. We have thus well-established forestry companies also all across Canada with assets, existing assets. And when I speak about sustainability, it's the three pillars that we know well, economic, social, environmental, all the three together at the same time. So we may have some compromise in some inside for sure, but we have those assets in place that are making you know, the life of many uh, uh, possible in many uh, little uh, uh, villages and cities around Canada. We have that those forestry companies now having access to large markets. We have access to the biomass value chain, which is extremely well developed under uh, well, you know, sustainable targets that we have. On the outside, we have innovative leaders and experts across the country from the academic, more scientific, also supportive in terms of uh, research and development centers that are there to emulate new innovation and to support, you know, the development, should it be from the harvesting end side, so at the beginning of the value chain to the end of the value chain with the bioproduct. We have also that business transformation environment that can be supported. We have the government that is that is listening, then taking action. We can take it as being too slow, too shy, whatever. But there is a dialogue in place. We are not in a, in a, you know in a bubble advancing uh, without any recognition from the government. And we have a large market next door, internally of course Canada, but also next door. We have that in the US. We have also external value chains to uh, Asia and also to Europe that are well set up that we can build on. And there are some logistical uh, discussion, you know, around those competitive advantages that we can build on. So this is right there. We have it. And some may not be as competitive as in some other countries, but we have this. And that competitive advantage in those competitive advantage in my mind should be exploited to a greater meaning than only what we are doing now. Well, one of the things we are doing now is manufacturing biofuels, particularly the wood pellets, much of it being done in British Columbia. And that bioproduct is being sold right now to the UK, not without some criticism as far as the environmental effect of that trans-Canada, transatlantic export. But without dismissing that point, at least now we know there are markets for these bioproducts. And there you can ask yourself, you know, if shipping out across Canada and across the Atlantic Ocean is at the end of the day uh, 
you know, something that will support us. I think that Canada will have no retribution from that from an GHG emission reduction perspective, unless then we are, we, we are sending out our beautiful wood. And I'm not saying that this is not part of the game. I'm saying that it's potentially a first step towards an innovative vision within a company. Investing into um, added value uh, products from our wood, uh, getting out the right fiber lengths that could be used uh, into new biomaterial, uh, getting out our lignin to be used in some specific, uh, you know, or functionalized into a specific uh, application uh, to get out the right performance and so on and so forth. We are not talking commodity there. We are talking added value. We are talking not tons of volumes. Sure. However, it's not because it's not ton of volumes that the margins creation is not there. It's there. So we have to reinvent the way we are looking at it in a manner that potentially existing value chains, local, more local and regional value chains are there. But though the market, the end market is a large end market, it's the global market there. So there will still be discussion about logistics. I was working with a company recently extracting a certain component out of wood. And at the end of the day, this is a, 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 a water-based <laughs> component. When you, tr when you transport it from a mill to another mill, it makes no sense because you transport water. You pay for transportation of water. So now where is the innovation? Oh, let's go into drying this. How this will be feasible and can we you know, uh, dry it without compromising on any type of performance. And there, there are some answers. Yes, maybe. So the easy answer will not be there. Innovation takes time, not only on technology, but how to partner, how to bring that to the market. And that it's an open door to something I would very much like to discuss. It's about the ecosystem. How can we do that? We cannot do that alone. We can, and we should not do that alone. We should not just say, Primary transformation done, this is what gets out of my meal. Who wants it? Who wants to take it? No, we, we, we will be losing inside this. We will be losing all the value that we may retain and the potential downstream um, value that we can add by further transforming and, 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 and functionalizing. So by recognizing our competitive advantage that we have expertise, this expertise resides in Canada, may reside also elsewhere around the world, but is there. Things are done. Millions of dollars have been invested by governments across the world to see what can we do with lignin? What can we do with hemicellulose? What can we do with cellulose? They are things that are quite well known right now. We have companies moving on with their technology development right now at a stage where basically they went through their uh, valley of death, as we say, you know, from a pilot to a commercial scale and being able to sell solutions and partner to sell those solutions. And there are those people on the end of the value chain, those that will buy the end product that need that from a regulation perspective are pushed to find solution. So that all value chain is there. How can we recognize this and develop ecosystems that will bridge all of those pieces of the puzzle together to support the development of innovation. So let me let me ask you a couple of questions and just on that because the, the the innovation, as far as the technology and the development or the reuse or the the full use, shall we say, of all that wood product, is one thing. How innovative do we need to be to create the markets here in Canada for that? Um, because somebody has to buy it. And yep. right now I, I realize that, you know, there are certain components of the fiber of the wood fiber that can be used in asphalt and, and cosmetics. And there are things that are just, I never would have thought of. I mean, a lot of people still shake their head <laughs> at the idea that that paper is a wood product, right? So, and that's been around forever. So yeah. the, uh, the idea that we've expanded our definition of a wood product in and of itself is something, but we need to, to your point, there are people who can use it um, but again, that's a shift in their business model to some degree. So yeah. it's a very incremental approach. Yeah. We need to be innovative in, in making them understand that 
if you want to use it in your asphalt, actually there's carbon capture in the asphalt that you're putting down on the street out in front exactly. of your house. Exactly. Exactly. And you will see there, are, I was I was sharing a, a, a panel this week during uh, the Pepper Week conference, and uh, it was about innovation. And I had Pepper Excellence there, Kruger, Cascade, um, Canfor, Clabin, and Susano. So two representation from the from the southern hemisphere, and it was excellent the way they basically spoke about innovation, and they say, well, you know what, we have to consider we have assets in place, and we are constrained by that. But there is a shift to be done in seeing that as being a constraint or seeing that as being an opportunity. And when you assess a project, and I have seen that many occasions through projects that I've been running, it goes through an appropriation process within the company. And this appropriation process considers specific benchmark and KPIs to make a decision whether or not to invest and move on with a certain business. If you don't put innovation as being part of the mandate and the vision of the company, then certainly you will never meet any types of KPI. Too much risk, low return on investment over the short term, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't ring a bell. It's a, it's a red light. But when you set innovation as being, you know, a potential driver for survival of our means by a transformation that could be a stage-wise transformation, minimizing any types of risk that we can as we go on. And then on the same times that you embrace the fact that you don't know with innovation, you are seeking answers. But how can you seek answers when you don't understand what's happening on the market? Should you do your own work and become an, ins an expert about what's happening in the oil and gas or what's happening in the asphalt domain? No. First, you don't have the time, neither is your expertise, neither it's where you should put your focus. But you can team up with them. You can create that new value chain. You can identify the needs, though we are in Canada. We need to consider that in Canada, we have needs, we have existing markets, we have existing piece of value chains, but that potentially the end market is outside of Canada. And potentially, we can attract those companies to get access to what is our gold mine, which is our forest. But how can we team up with them? Getting the ownership, keeping that ownership of that part of the value chain, and still being able to contribute on a global basis to a greater mean of having bioproduct made out of food. And we have amazing examples around, even within Canada, examples of new innovation that as being the risk by being used internally into pulp and paper product, replacing some part of the resin with lignin, replacing some part of agent that help to reinforce the fiber by different types of extract that we can get from the wood. So our companies are starting that shift, but now we need to push to the next stage and say, okay, so now less commodity, think about how we can move forward. Less commodity, more value. We heard the phrase value chain used a lot in both of these discussions and how important it is for the forestry industry to see itself as a solution for other industries. I love that Virginie considers it innovative to create a new value chain by identifying needs and solutions from one sector to the next. When forestry products are seen as, for example, a solution for oil and gas, for mining, for asphalt, for cosmetics, for electricity generation, these innovative relationships are the strength of the value yeah, chain. Yeah, and it was kind of reassuring to get her perspective on the unique advantages the Canadian forest sector brings to the global bioeconomy. So that's a wrap for this episode of Canadian Forestry Can Save the World. In the next episode... We're going to look at where forestry fits into the Coalition for a Better Future. And I have a pretty good idea where it fits in. Of course you know. We've already recorded the episode. <laughs> it's not a secret to you. No. 
We feature a spirited discussion with Derek Nybor, who's the president and CEO of the Forest Products Association of Canada. And Rosemary Thompson joins us. She's the executive director of the Coalition for a Better Future. It's a roundtable you will not want to miss. All right. For Dave, our producer, Becky Coles, and our small but mighty team at Story Studio Network, thanks for listening. This podcast series is produced for Forestry for the Future. And for more information, I'd encourage you to visit the website forestryforthefuture.ca. And you may want to get involved in supporting a sector that's committed to growing a greener economy and driving our country towards a net zero carbon future for you and your kids. I'm Dave Trafford, and Canadian Forestry Can Save the World is produced by Story Studio Network. This is SSN.